Hey guys, welcome to Harvest Point Church Online. We're so excited. We are launching into a brand new series this week. Uh, it's called Effective Members. And I've got my good friend, Justin Schultz, bringing the word for us today. He's going to kick us off for the start of this new series. So be excited, be expectant, and let's come and see what God wants to do this morning.
church as we come around communion this morning if you'd just like to open your bibles to matthew 26 i'm going to read 26 to 28 it says as they were eating jesus took some bread and blessed it then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying take this and eat it for this is my body and he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to god for it he gave it to them and said each of you drink from it for this is my blood which confirms the covenant or promise between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. You see, I really just want to focus on verse 26. See, as you know, this is the uh, last supper that Jesus has with his disciples just before he's about to be crucified. And I found it really interesting how he talks about his body and he's saying, eat eat of it, eat of it. This, this bread resembles my body. And as we enter into this new series called Effective Members, as I was reading this, God just highlighted it to me that the best way we can be an effective member of the body is to partake in the member, which is His Word. It is God. It is Jesus Himself. It's partaking in His fullness. It's not just remembering what He did for us, but it's partaking in him in his fullness in his glory in his presence in his goodness in his grace it's partaking in him and it talks about how the covenant or the promise is that it's going to forgive the sins of many so whoever partakes in this whoever believes in their heart confesses with their mouth that jesus is lord they will be saved and then they can partake in the goodness of him hallelujah so if you're with me this morning let's just pray and partake together father we just thank you so much for the body and blood that was that was shed for us it was poured out father and we just thank you god right now that we can come together and we can partake of your fullness we can partake of you in your goodness in your grace god we thank you lord that this is the covenant you made with us that you have forgiven our sins god past present and future father that whatever we do from this point on is forgiven by you father and we thank you that we can just look unto you the author and finisher of our faith god and we just worship you and we thank you for how awesome and wonderful you are in the mighty name of jesus we pray amen let's just eat and drink together good morning and welcome to harvest point church what a day it is to be in God's presence and living for Him. Over the last few weeks, Pastor Jesse has been sharing about the glory of God. The series started just as COVID-19 was really taking hold in Australia. And it was amazing to see how those messages were preparing us for what was to come. As a recap, what I got out of the series was, the answer is God in every situation. When people look for truth, they find a person. Jesus lived out of the supernatural. We need to refuse normality and through faith seek the supernatural. And Jesus wants to meet us face to face. When our eyes are on him, the distractions of this world aren't distractions at all. And the five characteristics of Christ, humility, justice, mercy, purity, and peace. Today we're moving out of the glory of God into a new series called Effective Members. Pastor Jesse will be sharing about the revelations God's been giving him about the body and how each of us are called to be effective members and how specific parts of the body interact and work together. But today the message is titled the call. If you've got your Bibles with me, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse 18. 
the calling of the first disciples. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon and Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting their net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. Lord, we just thank you that each of us are in our homes and we can be together listening to this message. Father, I just pray that it's your words and not mine. And that the message today just speaks to each of us from exactly where we're at. In your name we pray. Amen. My name's Justin Schultz, for those of you who don't know me. And today I get to share with you my story of how God's been showing me what it is to be called into the discipleship and to be a servant of God. As a way of context as to who I am, I'm a hobby farmer. And I get to see nature in a way that not many other people do. Most people only get to see them in pictures and I get to see animals and nature in real life. I've also given up trying to build my own kingdom. I've stopped. And now, I'm aspiring to be a full-time kingdom builder for God. I've been privileged in my professional career And I had the opportunity to watch a lot of people in their agricultural businesses. I got to walk side by side with them in making big decisions and small decisions and sorting problems out. And I've seen many people and and the biggest privilege was actually being able to watch people fail and learn from, from some of their failures. Most of the time people failed because they fell into the human trap of trying to build their own kingdom. They tried so hard to make it work that they actually missed the point and their purpose in life. They get to the end and they realise what they had worked so hard for didn't amount to anything. They wanted to leave an enduring legacy and all they ended up with was a hard life that was unfulfilled. By profession, I'm an engineer, a problem solver, And I became really good at thinking outside the box, solving problems for farms, farmers, and in projects by applying principles from other industries and different parts of the world. In essence, I became a a change manager. I'd help businesses identify inefficiencies, find solutions, and help them implement them. But very quickly, I became aware that to achieve great things in this life, I had to be part of a team. And I realised that leading teams and creating a culture of achievement where everyone wanted to work together was the only way to really have success. I realised that teamwork and the culture was the key. Looking back on my professional career, I've also realised that the greatest achievements I had all happened when I was part of a team. Now, don't get me wrong, I I was able to achieve stuff by myself too. But in the context of, of what seemed great, it always happened when I was part of a team. When potentially I was doing less, but enabling the team to do more. When each member of our team were doing their job and allowed to contribute, the sum of all the efforts were multiplied. God showed me and taught me that everyone in the team mattered and it's only when we were all contributing that the team would have achieved its full potential. God showed me that people matter and his heart is that everyone's contributing and is part of his team. Or as the Bible terms it, the body. He wants everyone in relationship with him. Each of us matter and we're all called to be disciples of Christ and be part of the body. If you'd like to 
in your Bibles, go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And then down to verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works out of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Who wants the whole measure of the fullness of Christ? How good. So if everyone matters and everyone has a part to play, what does that look like when we can't meet? I'm preaching a service here with no one in the room what does the body of christ look like today how do you play your part how do you follow your calling when church as we know it is completely different at the start we read about four fishermen where jesus placed a call on their life now at first glance it appears that it was the first time these guys have probably met jesus after hearing Jesus' call, they simply walked away, left their lives to follow Jesus. It was interesting that although this was pretty early on in the Gospels, in terms of uh, a time frame, it was actually about a year into Jesus' ministry, about 12 months after he was baptised by John the Baptist. And Jesus already had a group of followers when he called these fishermen into full-time discipleship. And it wasn't actually the first time that Jesus had met Simon or Andrew. Andrew had actually been present when Jesus was baptised by John the Baptist. And Simon had already been given his new name, Peter, by Jesus. So to get the full picture on how this story actually relates and how the call of these fishermen come together, we actually need to look at all the Gospels to get the full picture. So if you're with me in your Bibles, come across to John 1, verse 35. So this is a story where Jesus has just been baptised by John the Baptist. So John 1, starting at 35. The next day, John was there again with his two disciples. So this is John the Baptist's disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said... Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. So this is John the Baptist's disciples. Two of them pulled up stumps and started following Jesus instead of John. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour. Andrew... Simon Peter's brother was one of the two that had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to go and find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Peter. So that was the day after Jesus was baptised, about 12 months before he called Simon and Andrew to follow him full time. 12 months. So some more questions with this context. But why didn't Simon, Peter and Andrew start following Jesus from that day? They had both just discussed that he was the Messiah. Jesus had just renamed Simon Peter. So for further explanation, let's go to Luke chapter 5, verse starting at verse 1. So this is the parallel story from what we read in Matthew. Calling of the first disciples. One day, as Jesus was standing by Lake Genesaret, but it's also Lake Galilee, 
with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw on the water's edge two boats, left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. He sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deeper water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. He knew he was Jesus already, didn't he? When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signalled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at his knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so was James and John, the son of Zebedee's, who were Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled up their boats up onto the shore, left everything, and followed him. So why after Simon Peter and Andrew's discussion that Jesus was the Messiah, did they need the supernatural fishing haul for Peter to fall on his knees and follow Jesus? He already knew that he was the Messiah. Maybe, as Pastor Jesse's been preaching about over the last few weeks, it was the glory of God manifesting in this supernatural that meant the distractions of life stopped being a distraction. Now, the four fishermen were called Simon and Andrew. They were brothers. And their business partners, James and John, all had a connection to each other. So you'd have to assume that they'd all discussed that Jesus was the Messiah over the last 12 months. As business owners, and the four being in business together, God showed up, provided an enormous catch, which, was mo which most likely enabled all four men to realise that following this Jesus was more important than running their business and building their own kingdom. Jesus turned up one morning and did in a few moments what they'd been spending all night trying to achieve. They came to the realisation that, that the distraction of their kingdom wasn't worth having their eyes on him. So the call was to become fishers of men. And this call happened over 12 months, not instantly. And we know that they didn't sell their businesses, but more likely left the businesses in someone else's care while they're on this sabbatical with Jesus. And I, I guess we assume this because we know that within days of Jesus' death, these four men were back being fishers, were back being fishermen. So you're probably sitting there saying, well, that's really good, Justin, and very interesting, but... How does that relate to us now? When we hear the call to be fishers of men, I guess we need to understand the context that the call was. It wasn't from a point where these men had no relationship with Christ. They already knew who Jesus was. And the context that Jesus is talking about isn't our modern day context of fishing. They didn't follow someone blindly that they didn't already know. Back in the year 2000, I was uh, in my youth and I got to attend a conference in Sydney called Turning Point. Um, one of the keynote speakers at that conference was um, a guy called Paul Coleman. Um, I'm not sure how many people know who Paul is, but he was a, a Christian artist and he had a band um, called the Paul Coleman Trio um, and, uh, and later on he ended up um, I think he might still be playing for the Newsboys. Um, but it was, it was during that time Paul was talking to us on, on the Saturday night that he really opened up this concept of, of the call of being fishers of men to me. And when Jesus was talking about fishing, he was talking about fishing with nets, not hooks and lines and no bait. Fishermen in, in, in the Sea of Galilee only spent a fraction of their time hauling the catch in. Most of the time was spent drying the nets and repairing the nets and 
strengthening the ties. For us now, the, the call to be fishers of men is about having strong nets. It's about having strong relationships, strong ties in the body of Christ. And with those, God places in our lives. We are to spend most of our time relating to people, caring for each other, loving the unlovable, so that when God's ready, our nets are ready to haul in the catch. Now in the main, God chooses ordinary people to accomplish his grand designs. If we look across all of, 12's ori- look across all of Jesus' original 12 disciples, you'll see that they were really all just everyday men. Um, I guess the Bible gives us some information about six of them. So we've already talked about the four business owners and fishermen. Um, the other two that we have some information on was, was Matthew the Levi and tax collector. He was, I guess, like a, a money man or an accountant. We also have a zealot. Um, I guess for me, um, I describe him a bit like a politician. Um, he was trying to help the Jews revolt against the Romans. But through these common men, they go on to be the hands and feet of God. They're all instrumental in some way of being a part of the body of Christ and fulfilling his great commission. And we're all called into this service to be part of the body. Like the original fishermen, I believe God uses everyday situations to show what it is to be in part of his body. For me as a, as a hobby farmer, um, I guess God's really shown me what it is to be in service through my dogs. Um, let me introduce you to Tiny. Tiny's the, uh, the little puppy that's been held by my daughter Verity in the middle. He was the, the runt of the litter. And after all the other puppies had been picked by the, their owners, I was left with Tiny. Now, his mother Daisy was, uh, was a champion, but I didn't actually get to work with Daisy that long. Um, she was in her prime when I was still working as an engineer. And so, um, so yeah, I didn't, didn't get to invest a lot of time with Daisy and there wasn't a whole lot of cattle work to do because I was busy in my professional life. And so by the time we got to, to breeding Daisy, she, uh, she used to have a lot of trouble feeding her puppies. And so whenever she had a litter of pups, it meant that, uh, that we became full-time puppy feeders for the f- at least the first few weeks. Um, but that really gave us a chance to watch these little little fluff balls um, grow into cute little puppies and it, it probably really cemented the, the bond that I had with, with my dog called Tiny from such a small age. Now I grew up on a farm at Dolby um, and we had a, a little bit of livestock but mainly we were, we were cropping um, and I've always been, been very passionate about farming and I've always felt as though agriculture will be a big part of my life. And I, I really wanted my own children to have that same privilege, to, to be able to grow up on the land with, with the freedom of space and, and the responsibility of looking after, I guess, nature and animals. So while I was still working full-time as an engineer, we were really working hard to, to try and create this, this uh, pathway where we could be full-time farmers. And so we were living on the property and we are doing a lot of our work on, on weekends and, and wherever I could. But in 2014, I... I started the transition from being an engineer to a full-time farmer. And as a transition, I took on a a two-year contract with the government, um, which ended up uh, being crammed into four years. And at the conclusion of that job, the the plan was to be a full-time cattleman with a prospect of building a feedlot in the future. I guess the the biggest problem was was that as a cattleman, my, my main job is to be able to muster my cattle but I couldn't do it. My, my experience and my growing up was with machinery and, and or irrigation, not with, with cattle and horses. And I just couldn't do it. The cattle weren't there for me. I I'd tried to refence the paddock. I, I knew the theory of mustering. I'd, I'd try. But in the end, I guess I was completely reliant on other people to help me do my primary job. And I was really wondering if I'd actually heard God's call correctly. In the end, I gave up riding motorbikes and realised that the only way I'd have a chance of, of being able to muster cattle was to get a team of dogs that probably knew more about handling cattle than I did. At that stage, Tiny was about two years old and the perfect age 
for starting to work. You can see in the picture here, I'm there with a couple of my kids and Tiny's there just by our side with the horses. Now, over the last couple of years, I guess we've grown as a team and I now have four dogs in work and, and two more training. Um, and I don't even get nervous now going out to muster cattle. I have complete confidence in the team that when we go out into the paddock, we'll achieve what we set out as our task. Now, when I first started, mustering was all about me getting in behind the cattle and pushing them and the dogs would be out the front holding them up so they didn't run. And in reality, I guess the, the dogs and I were, were working against each other. As I wanted the cattle to move, the dogs were trying to stop them. And I was at the point where I could get the job done, we could always get the cattle in. But it just became the focus to just get the job done. Due to some, some unexpected circumstances, um, I actually fell into, into a, a, a role one day where I got to, to work and spend the day mustering with what you would call a dog whisperer. Um, for today, we'll call him Trevor. Now, the stories of what Trevor's dogs could do were amazing. He was in perfect connection with his dogs. He never yelled. He ever only whis whistled. He could be out on a horse and he could send his dogs off in just one direction to the other side of the paddock, out of sight, and he'd just sit there and wait for his dogs to bring the cattle to him. Now, the dogs couldn't see the cattle when they left him, but they were able just to go out searching in the general direction that Trevor sent them, and he'd just wait. That day I learned that the ideal way to muster was for the cattle to follow me. And it was a dog's job to bring the cattle to me. The dogs were never to work between me and the mob. So the idea was, was that the dogs and I had to work in together, not against each other, so that the cattle felt safe coming to me. The dogs and I had to stop working together and we had to start working as a team. I remember thinking, how, how is that possible to train your dogs to do that? Now in my business, I guess my business is about converting energy into protein. So I make money by growing grass and then converting that through my cattle into protein that I sell. Now the more efficiently I can do that, the more successful I'll be as a businessman. And I guess a big part of that efficiency is being able to muster my cattle in the lowest stress way I can. And so the key component of that is making sure that my cattle never feel like they ever want to run. I guess it's a bit of a, a misconception from maybe some of the Western movies that when you go out on a muster, you're chasing these cattle all over the paddock. Cattle actually like to follow. They like to walk, and they don't like running. They get hot and bothered when they run. They lose weight, and due to their size, if they get that hot and bothered, they run straight over the top of you, and you lose control. So after spending the day with Trevor, I realised that my priorities were slightly wrong. For me, the important thing each day was to get the mustering done in the lowest stress. But after that day with Treasure, Trevor, I realised that the most important thing was actually my dogs and, I was, and working together with them as one. The task of mustering had to become a second priority, ensuring that my dogs and I were as one had to be my main. When each member of the team, so each member of the team had to matter more to me than getting my cattle into the yards. Now you can see by this next photo that after about a year, there's been quite a transformation in how we muster. You might not be able to see in the picture, but you can see that the cattle are following me. I'm riding a horse, trying to take a selfie. It's my arms aren't long enough to get the horse in the picture. But what you can see in the photo, or what you can't see in the photo, is where my dogs are. Or what they've done leading up to this photo. So I'd learned that when I care more about the development of each member of the team, and the team's contributing, the output's multiplied. When I was focusing on the task, rather than on the people around me, I could get the job done. But when I focused on my team, the job became like play. 
We always get the task done now, generally in less time and less stress. When I cared more about the members of the team, instead of looking at the task, the task looked after itself. Now it took Jesus about 12 months to convince four fishermen to follow him. But based on the outcome of these disciples, I believe it was more important for Jesus to develop these leaders and men than to complete his task. Both got done, don't get me wrong, but they were done in the right order. And Peter became the rock of the church. I've learned some important personal lessons as well from my team in regards to service. My dogs are in service to me as part of my team. And when we're working, we now act like one body doing the one job. And three attributes I've learned about service from my dogs. The first is the excitement of obedience. Seems hard. But Tiny, as the leader of my dogs, he's also, and also all the other dogs, they're in complete submission to me as their master. Now, not submission as oppression, but they are so excited to obey me that they'll follow me and my command. I feed, I nourish them, I protect them, I provide a home for them. And, that, and in return, they're happy just to be in my presence doing as I ask. The second, the joy of the work. Now, other than being fed, the most exciting part of the dog's day is when they're out working with me. Nothing is more exciting than to be out on the job. It's such a joy for the dogs, for what I think is work. <laughs> and for the dog, it's play. They are so passionate about just being with me and on the job that for them they treat it as play. How good would it be if our mindset was that every day it was just play to be in our Heavenly Father's presence working for Him? The third point. Sharing in the vision as their master. Now when I get to muster my cattle and, and work from a horse, I get a certain perspective over the mob that the dogs don't get. And in many cases, I can see and give commands that from a dog's view doesn't make sense. Over time, my dogs have learnt to trust me in my vision and my perspective. And now as a team, I get to share vision and they carry out the work to achieve the common goal. Doesn't that sound familiar? Now when I talk about my dogs, they, they definitely aren't a perfect team. And... Uh, and I guess the, the other part of service that I've found is, is really hard to teach a dog, and I haven't got down pat yet, is that there's actually two modes of operation. So the first mode is when I'm present and the dogs are with me. Now the second one, which I haven't got down pat yet, is getting the dogs to work when I'm not present. Working together, it's like second nature for us. It's easy. But when I need the dogs to stay and look after a mob of cattle in the corner of a paddock and I've got to go and check a fence or I've got to go and look for some strays, I need the dogs to be able to sit there and wait with the cattle until I return. But at the moment, as soon as I start moving away, they just want to follow me rather than stay and look after the herd that we've got together already. In life, our hardest challenges seem to come when we're on the job and somewhat feeling as though we're on our own. Maybe we've been thrown a little temptation where we know that no one else will ever find out. We're left to our own devices with no consequences if we clock off. One, one story that comes to mind was a, a few years ago when we were doing some renovations on our house. We are at the hardware store in Dolby picking up some supplies and I had to get 10 boxes of bolts, each with 10 bolts in them. Now, the total of this should have been about $100, $120, something like that. And as we're going through the checkout, um, I had five kids with me, and the attendant was having a little bit of trouble scanning as they normally sell these bolts as a, as a single unit, not a box of bolts. So we had to look them up, and there was a bit of mucking about. And one of my, one of my older kids come to me and, and said, Dad, Dad, uh, one of the kids had just walked out with a washer in their hand. 
because I'd, I'd just sent them to the car. So I was sort of a bit upset and uh, I quickly paid and headed for the car. I didn't sort of deal with the checkout attendant too much because I had to deal with this washer in the car. So I called the child out and we, we, we dealt with the situation. The washer was returned. I guess, uh, I guess for a three-year-old it looks a lot like a coin. Anyway, we pulled up at our next stop and I was waiting for my wife to finish the grocery shopping and my, went, my mind went back to the transaction at the hardware store. Checking the receipt, I realised that instead of being charged for 10 boxes of bolts, I'd only been charged for 10 bolts. What a win! Or not. I'd just corrected my child for taking a 20-cent washer and I'd walked out of the shop with $120 of free bolts. There was no way anyone would ever follow me up or paid with a credit card. It was an honest mistake and it was in my favour. But for me, how could I expect my child to understand it was wrong to take a 20 cent washer when I walked out of the store with $120 of free bolts? So back we went to the hardware store and I explained to the error to the checkout attendant. He was shocked and somewhat speechless he actually thought I was mad. He realised his mistake, but he couldn't believe that with the mistake in my favour that I felt compelled to make it right and pay the correct amount. I realised then that our human nature was that when we know we're on our own, without fear of retribution, we always give in to flesh. The hardest lesson for us all to learn is how to be in service to God when we think no one is looking. The test of our character as a servant is to be able to be the same when we know we're in his presence and when we know we're not. In conclusion, for today, I want to leave us with two thoughts. The first is from my dogs. Are we able to give up utter abandonment for our master's purpose. Love for Christ and being his disciple is a deliberate setting of our will to carry out his command at any cost. We can't see what God sees. We don't have his perspective, like I had on the horse for my dogs. But that's why it's so important for us to live for following his command rather than doing what we think will bring us fulfilment. It is the delight of being on the job with our Father in the body, no matter what the cost or how big the challenge. Now the second is from the fishing analogy. In Matthew, the words were, Come follow me, I will make you fishers of men. So today as you sit at home in your isolation, how are you rebuilding your nets? How are you patching your holes? Strengthening your ability to be an effective member in the body of Christ. In our physical isolation, there are so many ways we can be rebuilding and building our nets. Loving others is so easy these days with the technology. God is preparing for a catch. Are our nets going to be ready? Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for joining us this morning online. I trust you just had an amazing time. I pray and believe that God has touched you, that he's been speaking to you. And you know what? If he has spoken to you in any way, shape or form, I just want to ask that you just get in contact with us via our website or Facebook. Um, you'll see the prompts to our website um, as you follow the screen. And if I could ask you just one more thing, if you feel led to, or if I can ask you to even pray about giving to Harvest Point Church. If, if you want to help us take this message further and reach more people around this world, then I pray that you just trust God and give into what God wants to do through us. Thank you very much.